Let's pray together. Almighty God, these words tug at our heartstrings. They whet our appetite for that moment when we will see your face. When we will no longer be here in this struggle, in this broken world. When all the tensions will go away. When the fight with sin in our hearts will be over. When the wrestling against the curse will be done. And best of all of it, we will be with you in your unvarnished presence, beholding your glory. You have always been king. You are always in charge. You are always the giver of all good gifts. But we will not have to believe it. We will simply see. We will be there. Longing will be done. Fulfillment will be in place. Lord, you are what makes eternal life so good. You are our treasure, our reward, our great joy, the desire of our hearts. Lord, we have cashed in everything in order to have you. And yet we feel in our hearts the distractions, the temporal distortions, the lesser loves that creep in, and our mixed up hearts of sin. We say that we love you and how we long to love you better than we do. And when we get home, we will love you as we should. And we look forward to that day. Help us now as we open your word, even as we look to the future. The future is settled because you, the Ancient of Days, the sovereign orchestrator of all history, have pre-written the future. And we trust you. Help us to see what you want us to see. And by the power of your spirit this morning, would you change us by your word? In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I would invite you this morning to turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 7, and we will continue our verse-by-verse study of this book. This morning we go back to the future, to this scene in Revelation chapter 7, which answers the question that ended chapter 6. Chapter 6 was the culmination of a series of judgments against God, or from God, against those who will dwell on the earth during the time of the tribulation. And as Jesus opens the scroll and breaks its seals, it unleashes a series of cosmic cataclysms against the earth. And the question of the people on the earth at that time will be, the wrath of the Lamb has come and who can stand? They intend it as a rhetorical question. And yet it has an answer. Chapter 7 answers that question. We looked last week at the 144,000 who will in fact stand during the outpouring of God's judgment. These are those specially selected by God's grace of first fruits of Jewish males who are alive at that time, who will then become the seed of a great harvest of people who come to know Christ during earth's darkest period. What we see this morning is a different group. The 144,000 were 12,000 from each of the tribes of Israel. We have here this morning a people saved by grace during the tribulation from every tribe on the earth, from every nation, from every language, from every people. What we see in chapter 7 is mercy in the midst of wrath. At this period of time, the seven-year period of the tribulation, and then what Jesus calls the great tribulation, the second half of it, the last three and a half years, will be the darkest days of earth's history. And yet it will also be the period of the most effective explosion of evangelism in world history. The gospel will in fact go to every nation and tribe and people and tongue and a great uncountable multitude of them will believe the gospel. We saw last week those 144,000 first fruits of gospel harvest at the end of the age. That, by the way, is not the national faith and repentance of Israel that's coming at the end of the tribulation. 
but they likely become the seed of a massive revival of gospel proclamation and belief. And what is the reach of their witness? The Gentile world. All of it. As you think about your own life and you think about evangelism and missions and the longing that you have for people around you to come to know Christ, I don't know if you've ever felt isolated in that task, lonely in that task, ineffective in that task. I would suggest to you that making the gospel known in a world that is comfortable comes with its challenges. And I like to be comfortable. I like that we live in a free society where a proclamation of Christ does not cost me my life. That's not true for everybody in the world today. It's not true for many throughout world history. But I like having property rights and a stable government and a normalcy of life that allows luxuries and recreation. All of that's very comfortable. Simultaneously, all of that is very distracting from eternal realities. There's a principle we see in the passage we're going to look at this morning related to the upheaval of everything, the overturning of of every thread of society and an entire world made uncomfortable by cataclysms in nature, by the outpouring of God's judgment against the earth and by the rank anarchy and violence of a world gone wild. Those things have a way of getting our attention. Just like some tragedy or illness or difficulty or a diagnosis gets your attention. What will the gospel do in that age? We find out in this passage the gospel will go far and wide. Read with me our text this morning. Revelation chapter 7 beginning in verse 9. John records, After these things I looked and behold... A great multitude, which no one could count, from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, and palm branches were in their hands. And they cry out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God saying, Amen. The blessing and the glory and the wisdom and the thanksgiving and the honor and the power and the strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders answered saying to me, These clothed in the white robes, who are they and from where have they come? And I said to him, My Lord, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation. And they washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason, they are before the throne of God, and they serve him day and night in his sanctuary. And he who sits on the throne will dwell over them. They will hunger no longer, nor thirst any more, nor will the sun beat down on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will shepherd them and will guide them to springs of the water of life. And God will wipe every tear from their eyes. What is this passage about? This passage describes tribulation saints ushered from the darkest era of earth's history to the happiness of heaven's glory. These are tribulation saints ushered from the darkest days on earth to the happiness of heaven's glory. Let's look first at the earthly recipients of tribulation mercy. We see this group in Revelation 7 verses 9 and 10. John writes, I looked and behold a great multitude which no one could count from every nation and tribe and people and tongue. John begins verse 9 by saying, after these things, this is one of these uh, temporal markers in the book of Revelation. It's telling us that John has moved on to a new scene. This is a different group than we looked at last week. This is a different group of people. That was a countable number of males from certain tribes out of Israel. This is an uncountable number, male and female, from every tribe and people and nation and tongue. 
we discover here an international crowd. They are from everywhere. Next week, we'll look more fully at their description. But look down at verses 13 and following. One of the elders asked John, who are they and where have they come from? John says, you know. And he said to me, these are the ones who come out of the great tribulation. They washed their robes. They made them white in the blood of the Lamb. We will unpack that description next week. But how do we summarize that? These are people who live and believe during the great tribulation and are killed during the great tribulation and then find themselves in heaven before the great tribulation is finished, before the return of Christ to the earth. And we will find them to be alive, forgiven, present with God, worshiping, protected, satisfied, shepherded, and supremely happy. We'll unpack that next week if the Lord allows. In verse 9, what do we learn about them? We learn that this is a great multitude which no one could count. Does that mean somebody tried to count them and failed? No, it just means this is an uncountable number. It's beyond the attempt. Don't even try. If you've ever been at, at a convenience store or some contest and been challenged to count the number of jelly beans in a jar. This far exceeds that exercise. Think about John the Apostle seeing this, seeing the future. He was alone. He was the last surviving apostle. He was away from the people that he had cared for as a pastor. He was isolated, imprisoned, on the Alcatraz of the ancient world, the island of Patmos. It was a rock in the middle of the sea used as a prison. And John was exiled there. I think about those churches in Asia to whom he was writing. They were small. They were persecuted. They were persecuted by the Romans. They were persecuted by the Jews. There were temptations for them to compromise or to shrink in fear. How encouraging would this scene be? To know that you're not alone in the plan of redemption. That there is an uncountable sea of redeemed humanity that will surround the throne of the Lamb. We hear from the lips of Jesus that narrow is the path that leads to life. Christ himself said that many are invited, many are called in the gospel. Few are chosen. Sometimes we feel the narrow path and the fewness acutely. Maybe you walk the halls of a school or or work in a workplace where you're alone in your profession of faith in Christ. Maybe you're in a home and the only believer. We can feel alone and isolated. Perhaps like John felt alone on a rock in the middle of the sea. The message from this scene, Christian, is that God is saving an uncountable multitude. Hold on. Hold fast. Trust the Lord. He is committed to assembling a people for himself in such vast numbers that you would have to be able to count stars in the universe or count sand grains on the beaches to approximate the number of people here. And notice how this innumerable crowd is populated. Out of every nation, out of all tribes, out of all peoples, and out of all tongues. A reminder that the gospel that we believe is not a 21st century American thing. Didn't start with us anyway. This is the universal truth. The truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ is the universal and exclusive message. There is no other name under heaven by which men must be saved. You and I believe that Jesus, God in the flesh, is the only one capable of actually paying for sin. And it is in Him we've put our trust. But we're not alone. The message of Christ is not for our people, our culture, our language, our region. It is the message for every nation, tribe, and tongue. And God will assemble for Himself people from all of these peoples. This means that the Great Commission will succeed. 
It means that evangelistic outreach will be effective. That Jesus will actually get the people that he has purchased with his own blood. And during the great tribulation, he will do this in the worst of times. The darkest of times. When evangelism is the most difficult, it will simultaneously be the most effective. If you find yourself even this week in difficult relationships where it seems hard to share the gospel with others, know that the gospel has power to save uncountable multitudes in the darkest hours of the earth. We see this international crowd standing in the throne room of heaven. Look down at verse 9. This great multitude, which no one could count, were standing before the throne and before the Lamb. Notice that they are in heaven. This is the throne room scene that we looked at in Revelation chapter 4 and chapter 5. This exists prior to Jesus coming back to the earth and establishing his kingdom and ruling the nations. This is the scene in heaven, the same scene where Jesus has unlocked the scrolls and begun to usher in the judgments of God at the end of the age. And in this throne room scene, we saw the concentric circles of worship. There were those four living beings surrounding the throne, and then the 24 elders around them, and then the myriads and myriads and thousands and thousands of angels surrounding them. And here we have the uncountable number of the redeemed. And they join the choir. They join the praise of God. They are in heaven and they are at home. Think about the reality, Christian, that you are a citizen of a place you've never been. Your citizenship is in heaven, Philippians 3.20. And that your present earthly existence is a temporary one. Paul calls it a tent which will shortly be torn down and exchanged for our permanent residence, a home not built with hands. And what makes heaven home for the believer is that our Father is there, that God is there. All of us as creatures are children of God by right of creation. But if you are a child of the Father by adoption in grace, then heaven is home, uniquely so. Because our Father is there. He is the giver of all good gifts. He is the designer of all good things. To be in heaven is not to be bored. Sometimes uh, I have projected into heaven the assessment that my sort of religious or churchy experiences just need to be multiplied by infinity. And I'm just going to confess right now that I've yawned in church before. I've fallen asleep in sermons, even as some of you are tempted to do right now. (laughs) Don't think about heaven as the extension of boredom ad infinitum. God is the designer of things like taste buds and the giver of good flavors. God is the designer of fun and the inventor of your capacity to have it. He says, at my right hand are pleasures forevermore. We get mixed up when we redefine fun and good taste and pleasure, and we replace what it means to have these things in God with any other lesser thing. It's called idolatry. And the pursuit of joy short of God is the pursuit of things that will destroy you and leave you longing for things you can never have. But to locate your joy in Him is to locate your joy in the owner of the toy factory rather than some specific breakable toy. These in this passage have gone home. I hope that makes you homesick for your permanent residence, that we be just a little bit jealous of this scene. And notice in verse 9, they are standing. They're standing. This is a reflection of Jude 25, that God, through the gospel of His grace in Jesus Christ, 
makes his children blameless so that they can stand with great joy in the presence of the glorious one. Listen, it, it's not good to meet God unforgiven. Everyone will meet his maker. But if you go unprepared, clothed only in the things that you've done, it is a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. But these are standing. They are standing blameless and with great joy. This answers the question of 617, doesn't it? For the great day of the wrath has come and who is able to stand? These ones are. These ones are actually standing in the blazing glory of the very presence of God. Why? Because they got their act together? Because they cleaned themselves up? Because they did more good deeds than bad deeds? No, none of that stuff. Only by the grace of God and the forgiveness of Christ. We'll come to that. Look at the last part of verse 9. They are clothed in the forgiveness of Christ. Look what it says. They are clothed in white robes. This is remarkable on on several counts. Filthy clothes in Scripture are a symbol of moral filth. It's a symbolic way to describe inner dirt. Isaiah 64, 6 says, Your deeds, your righteous deeds, your best deeds are like filthy rags before me, says the Lord. The best that a human could offer is unacceptable before God. Our clothes are filthy in an emblematic sense of the inner condition of our hearts. And what are these tribulation saints wearing? Brilliant white robes. This is the emblem of the gift of perfect righteousness. That is, they have been forgiven of all of their uncleanness. This is the fulfillment of the great invitation of God Himself. Listen to Isaiah 1.18. Yahweh says, Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be white like wool. And here, these tribulation saints who were filthy, who were sinners, who were morally bankrupt and vile and corrupt, are now standing in the blazing glory of God in white robes. They stand now in a righteousness not their own, but as Paul said in Philippians 3.9, a righteousness that is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. It is an alien righteousness. Not one we could produce, not one we possess. It is the gift by faith. And the fact that they are clothed is a contrast to what they just came out of. If these are tribulation saints, if, if, these, who, if these are the ones who came out of the tribulation by their own death, what did they face just before this scene? I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew 24 and 25 are two chapters dealing with this same period of time that the book of Revelation is dealing with. And in the close of Matthew 25, Jesus is describing the scene that is recorded for us in Revelation 19 when he comes down to the earth. He is about to reign in his kingdom on the earth. And in preparation for that kingdom, he is going to sit on his glorious throne and he is going to judge everyone who is still alive at the time that he returns in Revelation 19. Read with me in verse 31 of Matthew 25. But when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne and all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom which has been prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. Naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. 
Then the righteous will say to him, Lord, when? When did we see you hungry and feed you? When did we see you thirsty and give you something to drink? And when did we see you a stranger and invite you in? When were you naked and we clothed you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. It's an interesting scene where Jesus is judging the earth dwellers who survived the great tribulation. And there are those who are his sheep who believe in him and live like he wants them to live. And then there are those who are not his sheep. They are called goats here in Matthew 25. And the basis of Jesus' assessment is their behavior. What I think is fascinating for us in relationship to Revelation chapter 7 is there is a, a mass of people, according to Matthew 25, who are imprisoned, who are hungry, who are thirsty, who are naked, whom believers in Jesus help. They give them clothing. They visit them in prison. They give them a cup of cold water. They bring them food. And what does Jesus say about that kind of help for his people? When you've done it to them, to the least of them, you have done it unto me. Now, there are implications for us in this age. We're not yet living during Matthew 25 or Revelation chapter 7. and, And this kind of kindness ought to mark the followers of Jesus. But there is a very special and particular application to the future when the mass of humanity will be judged on the assessment of when God's people were on the run, destitute, poor, naked, famished, Did you align yourself with them? Meet their needs? Care for them? Did you identify with Jesus when the world was at its darkest? And did you align yourself with his persecuted people when they were in need? That's the assessment in Matthew 25. And so we have this group of people described there who are naked and destitute and and hungry. And and those who faced the difficulties of persecution in the Great Tribulation and came out of it, not those who survive it to the end, but came out by death, think about what they faced. The book of Revelation will tell us that according to Revelation 13, 17, the Antichrist will demand a mark, the mark of the beast. And without that mark on the forehead and the hand, you will not be able to buy and sell. What would that mean for your ability to procure food, to get new clothes? Those who follow Jesus during that time will be on the run. They will be persecuted, prosecuted, and many of them executed. Many of them will move from destitute, starving, and naked in an era where food will be hard to get, clothing impossible to acquire, a cup of cold water will be a luxury. They will come out of the tribulation and ushered into heaven and will all of a sudden be wearing the best clothes they've ever had. The text we'll look at next week will go on to tell us they will never hunger, they will never thirst, they will never suffer from exposure in the elements while on the run. They're home and they're safe. And here in verse 9, we see them clothed, no longer naked, no longer destitute. They will be clothed like they have never been clothed before, fully ensconced in the brilliant white righteousness of the Son of God. We find out also in verse 9 that they will be celebrating their victorious redemption. Notice what verse 9 says, palm branches were in their hands. What does that mean? I I have palm branches in my hands when I'm trimming my trees. Palm branches were a significant element, a sign of victory in Roman culture. Uh, They were used to celebrate military and athletic victories. 
They were also used in Jewish culture as a reminiscent of several important events in Jewish history. The palm branches here may in fact be reminiscent of the Feast of Tabernacles. Palm branches were one of the several elements used during that celebration. The Feast of Tabernacles celebrated the redemption of the people of Israel. They lived in tents or tabernacles, temporary dwellings, to remember their, their temporary dwellings as they moved across the wilderness till they got to the promised land. The, the palm branches were used to make roofs on these temporary dwellings. And for years after they were in the land, when they had solid homes, they would still spend time living in tents just to celebrate, just to remind themselves of God's care and provision for them. Interestingly, in John chapter 12, verse 13, when Jesus enters Jerusalem to the, to the prophetic day that he was predicted to do so as king, palm branches are there. The people are celebrating the coming of the king. It is called his triumphal entry. Of course, he was rejected by the nation, rejected by the religious leaders. And it was, of course, Jesus' intent not to come and reign as king then, but to die as the suffering servant and actually pay for sins at the cross. His coming in victory as king would be his second coming. Do you remember what they cried? Hosanna, Hosanna. A reference to Psalm 118, 26 and the messianic hope. And the cry there is, save us, save now, be victorious. That's what Hosanna means. And so these tribulation saints who have been killed during the tribula tribulation and now find themselves in heaven have palm branches in their hands. This is an emblem of their victory. They're celebrating victory. Victory over all of the persecution and difficulty they just went through. Victory over the world. Victory over the Antichrist and Satan. Victory over their own sin. And the hailing of the one true king. They're in his presence. And they celebrate. We discover in verse 10 that they are also singing the song of celebration. Look at verse 10. They cry out with a loud voice saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. The text tells us they cry out with a loud voice. This is in unison. This is a massive, uncountable crowd. And they cry out with a voice. One voice. There is one song here. What would this sound like? Maybe you've been to a sporting event where the whole stadium is making noise. Have you ever been to a stadium that is all chanting the same thing at the same time? That's a different noise. Maybe you've been to a concert and seen one of those stadium anthem bands. Uh, you know, the kind of band that has the ability to get a massive crowd all singing the same thing at the same time. It doesn't even matter what the words are. It could just be a note. And everybody's doing it, ooh, all at the same time. It's powerful. It's, it's magical. It's a, a scene where with words together, in rhythm, on notes, for a few fleeting moments, it seems like the whole world has come together. Maybe you've been to a really good Christian conference where you've heard the preaching of the truth of God's Word and God's Word has informed the mind and, and it warms the heart and it provokes the will. You know God better, you love Him more and you're ready for holy action. But you're not alone. You, you, you've been in a, a living room full of people or a convention center full of people or a stadium full of people and they've all heard the same things. They've heard the same truths. They've been moved to the same holy action and you're singing together the same songs. It's remarkable. A massive crowd of believers assembled for the same purpose, affected in the same way, and the temporal distractions of earthly living grow strangely dim. It's a preview of heaven. And the best of that kind of thing is just small potatoes. I mean, if you've been at one of those 
big conference things. That's, that's just a small affiliation of Christians in your language, in your own culture, in, in your own era of history. And, and it's merely dozens or hundreds or, or thousands. And then you have to go back to work on Monday. Back to the fight with sin. You, you walk out of those moments with holy unction, ready for holy action, and then you go back to normal life. And you've got to live by faith. And you've got to run, and you've got to box, and you've got to buffet your body and make it your slave, and you've got to wait some more, and you've got to repent, and you've got to grow and struggle and make your way in this world by faith when the world is broken. And you go to work, and your labor is cursed, and you're in a body that's breaking down. You're amidst imperfect people and you're with earth dwellers who are blinded in the darkness of unbelief. It reminds us that we need Sundays. We need these previews of heaven and we love our retreats and our camps and our conferences. But what will it be like in heaven? I got to go to work on Monday. No, No, this is now your work. This is your recreation, occupation, joy, delight. It's everything you've ever wanted, your home. You don't have to leave. This isn't a temporary respite from a broken world. This is the forever. No sin left to fight. Uncountable numbers of the redeemed singing together the songs of redemption. In verse 10, when it says they cry out with a loud voice saying, that kind of sounds like talking. How do we know this is a song? I'm not sure we know absolutely this is a song, but look back at chapter 6, verse 9. That is the wrong chapter. Chapter 5, verse 9. We read, and they sang a new song, saying. And then they sang, said the words we just sang. The the word saying here, describing the content of the language, goes with this singing a new song. I get the impression from the throne room scene, the the concentric circles of worship in chapter 4 and 5 and then here in chapter 7, that these are songs being sung. Don't be misled by the the word saying here. Uh, The same word is used to introduce the song in chapter 5. This scene in heaven is an extension of that throne room scene in chapter 4 and 5. And more have been added to the choir. Uh, Who's been added Well, these believers who were killed during the Great Tribulation. And what is their content? Look down at verse 10. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. What are they saying? Glory to God. We're not here because we were smart enough to figure this out. God rescued. God saved us. Salvation is from Him and through Him and unto Him. It all belongs to Him. They ascribe every ounce of their presence in heaven to the credit of a saving God. This is their song. They are beggars, needy and dependent, and they have become recipients of love and the beneficiaries of divine initiation. This is gospel grace. That is the participation of this great international crowd. There's another group in this scene, verses 11 and 12. It is the heavenly audience to tribulation mercy. The heavenly audience to tribulation mercy. Notice in verse 11, and all the angels, all the angels... If you study angels in your Bible, you discover that they have assignments and duties, they have tasks and obligations, maybe even regions they're assigned to, but here they are assembled in heaven, and they are assembled to be witnesses of God's mercy. They are something like cheerleaders or boosters. They are an audience to mercy. In this scene, the angels are assembled to praise God for His work 
in redeeming humans out of the great tribulation. We see them first of all in verse 11, encircling the throne of God and the Lamb. Notice what verse 11 says, they are standing around the throne. And in the original here, you have a very rare verb tense. It is literally, they had been standing around the throne. And then the next phrase says, and they fell down. So the the background information for this scene is these angels have been assembled and they are standing in the concentric circles around the throne. You have God on the throne and the lamb at the center of that throne and the four living beings and the 24 elders and then the uncount or the uh, myriads and myriads and thousands and thousands of angels surrounding. And these angels had been standing. It is another answer to the question, uh, who can stand in the presence of God when he's angry? His holy angels, they've never sinned. They had been assembled in the throne room, encircling the centerpiece of heaven, the throne of God with the Lamb at the center. And then we discover in verse 11, they fall face down in worship. Look at this. All the angels had been standing around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God. You have to remember that angels are created beings. They have not always existed. They're not eternal in the sense of eternity past. Only God existed for all of eternity. Angels were made. And they are persons in the sense that they have personality. They are individuals and they are different from one another. But they are not human. They are not image bearers. They were not made in the image of God. Angels, just to go against the grain of popular think, are not graduated humans, right? We just got past the Christmas scene and there's that Christmas movie with the bell and every time the bell rings, an angel gets his wings and that angel was herald on earth back in the 1800s. That's not biblical. Angels are a separate class of creature altogether. Humans will never be angels. Angels have never been humans, Angels are spirits, they are messengers, and they are servants. And they are God's servant messengers who are spirits who can manifest in the physical realm. But remember that they are creatures and they must be worshipers. There is a creation hierarchy. Angels are of a lower class than humans. But for a little while, humans are lower than angels. What is that little while? Ever since the fall. And until man is glorified. Angels are finite and dependent creatures. They are not to be worshipped. Although they are so glorious in their manifest presence that John the Apostle himself was tempted twice to worship an angel. And the angel said, get up off the ground, do not do that, I am a fellow slave with you of our God. They themselves fall down on their faces before the greatness of God. And here, angelic worship is prompted by the mercy of God towards sinners. Stunning. These servants of God, these ministering spirits, are looking in on what God is doing with us human sinful beings. And notice what they do in verse 12. They join the chorus of praise. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, and we might imagine singing here as well, Amen, the blessing and the glory and the wisdom and the thanksgiving and the honor and the power and the strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. They utter this dramatic and pointed and rhythmic doxology. All glory to God. Uh, front end and back end with amen. It starts with an amen, ends with an amen. Amen just means truly. Uh, affirmation. Yes. I agree with that. And look what they cry out. The blessing to God. The glory to God. The wisdom to God. The thanksgiving to God. The honor to God. The power to God. The might to God. And if you're reading the Legacy Standard Version, it has the definite article, the, in there, which the original Greek text has as well. A lot of English versions leave out the, the. And they just say, blessing, glory, wisdom, thanksgiving, honor, power, and might. 
but the, the the is important because it means ultimate things belong only to God. The blessing or the well-speaking or the, the happiness ultimately is ascribed to God. The glory ultimately is ascribed only to God and on and on down the list. These things belong uniquely and supremely to God. Now the angels happen to be sharers in blessing. They're happy where they are. The angels happen to be sharers of glory. They they radiate the very glory of God. They dwell in the glory of God. But the glory they experience is not intrinsic to them. It is derived. Similarly, we humans can be blessed. We can experience happiness or blessing. But Those things are not intrinsic to ourselves. We do not self-exist. We do not have happiness in ourselves or give happiness radiating out from us to others in the way that God does. God is the source of all of it. He is the end of all of it here in this text. Wisdom, thanksgiving, honor, power, might, all of these things are ascribed to God in the sense that they properly belong to Him alone. And the ultimate realities of these things are all His. Think about these angels for a moment. Hebrews 1.14 tells us, they are ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation. There's your definition and business card of an angel. What is an angel? A ministering spirit. But what's its job? to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation. The the task of an angel is to serve God by serving sinful humans who are being saved who will wind up in heaven. Then we discover in 1 Peter 1.12 that angels long to look into the things of the gospel given to sinners. In in a sense, the, the angels are scratching their heads at sinners forgiven. They don't quite get it. Listen, angels get glory. They, they know what it means to be in the glorious presence of God. They know about the, the, the terrifying, awful wrath of God against sin. They are holy and they know the holy, holy, holy God. But the angels of heaven do not understand mercy, not personally, not experientially. They've never been forgiven. The angels of heaven will never be forgiven. They will never sin and therefore never need forgiveness. And the angels of hell will never be forgiven. They did sin and they do sin and they never will not sin and they will never experience mercy or forgiveness. For angelic beings, for the ministering spirits God designed for a purpose, the ones who sinned had a one and done shot. They sin and there's no forgiveness. Forever consigned to hell. In fact, the Bible tells us that hell properly belongs to the devil and his angels. So the angels of heaven understand glory. They don't experience forgiveness. They don't experience mercy. Uh, God's kind disposition towards those in a pitiable, awful state. The elect angels have been commissioned by God to serve those who will inherit salvation. And now this innumerable crowd of image bearers, corrupted, broken, rebellious, have been redeemed, plucked out of this worldwide trial of the great tribulation. They now stand forgiven in the glorious presence of Almighty God. And so the angels join in the chorus of glory and gratitude and praise to God for His being merciful to sinners. Look what God is doing with those rebels. He's saving them. Jesus tells us that the angels of heaven rejoice at the repentance of one sinner. What about this scene? Uncountable number from every tongue and tribe and nation and people out of the great tribulation, believing the gospel, repenting, being saved. These angels are singing. These tribulation saints in heaven 
they are not the only ones who will believe during that future period of the tribulation. Some will survive, live on the earth, and populate the millennial kingdom. But this group are the ones who will die. Many will be martyred for their faith. They, they will come to see their need of a Savior. They will believe in Jesus, and they will get killed for it. In short order. In something less than a period of three and a half years. Others, perhaps, will be victims of violence in a world gone haywire. Do you remember Chaz? Chaz Chop, the little downtown district in Portland, Oregon? Remember how that went? Imagine that worldwide on a global scale. Many will die just of the violence of anarchy. Many will die, no doubt, from natural causes. Starvation, exposure, aging out, failing health. And these tribulation martyrs and tribulation saints who died are not yet in their resurrected, glorified bodies. How do we know that? Turn to chapter 20 of Revelation. And look at verse 4. I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was given to them. And I saw, notice this, the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their witness of Jesus and because of the word of God, and who also had not worshipped the beast or his image, had not received the mark on their forehead or on their hand, and they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years." Uh, What does that mean? You have to fast forward to after Christ returns to the earth and establishes his kingdom until you get the bodily resurrection of these tribulation saints. What does that mean? In this scene in Revelation 7, they are absent from the body and they are present with the Lord. That should sound familiar to us. To be absent from the body and present with the Lord is the normal course of things in this era. Nobody has a resurrection, glorified, eternal body yet. Not the Apostle Paul, not Old Testament saints, only the Lord Jesus Christ. And so those who are in heaven with him now are like these future tribulation saints. They are bodiless And you might think, well, that's weird. That can't be good. I'd rather stay here longer and be in this body. And what does the Apostle Paul say about that? To be absent from the body and present with the Lord is better by far. No, we're not going to be sad for these tribulation martyrs any more than we would be sad for those who, having believed in Christ, went home. In fact, we might envy them. What did Paul say? Philippians 1.21 For me to live is Christ and to die is what? Gain. That's the Christian perspective. That's the biblical perspective on suffering for Christ, even suffering all the way to the end of being killed for Him. Do not fear man who can kill the body. Fear the Lord who kills body and soul in hell. Listen, what can they take from you, Christian? (laughs) Nothing that matters, really. This is a remarkable perspective. We actually prefer 2 Corinthians 5.8 to be absent from the body and at home with the Lord. Now listen, some generation of believers in this age, this era that we live in now, um, some generation will be raptured. They will bypass physical mortality. Like Elijah in the Old Testament, like Enoch in the Old Testament, they will bypass physical death and they will go straight to heaven. They will go from living on this earth to being translated into a glorified eternal body and be in heaven forever and they will never experience physical death here. We don't know when that generation is. It is in this era, but it might not be in our lifetimes. For most of us, for the redeemed of of most ages, we go through mortality. We go through the end of physical life here. And for those tribulation saints, not only will they come to the end of their physical life, but leading up to that, they will experience the worst tough times the earth has ever known. The darkest days in world history. 
and their rescue will be the vehicle called mortality. Think about that. These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation. Sounds nice. Yeah, I want out of that. How did they get out of it? Beheading, starvation. Those are tough times. You need to understand that standing with Jesus at home in heaven with palm branches in your hands, glorying in victory, singing the songs of redemption, that does not come about by escaping suffering. The Bible says that all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. This life is a life of suffering which terminates in our temporary tent torn down. That's the normal path of life. The little footnote exception is that generation someday that will be taken out without dying physically. But suffering is the normal part of life. And suffering is a very normal part of life in Christ. We don't escape that. Uh, We learn to embrace God's purposes in it. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for this look into the future at these precious ones that will belong to you who have been purchased by the Lamb's work on the cross who will one day hear the gospel and believe and then suffer and die and be home. And we think of all those who have gone before us who have breathed their last on this earth and have gone home. And in some measure, Lord, we envy that we long to be home and we trust your timing. We trust your purposes. We pray that as long as you give us breath, we would be those who take the gospel to every tongue and tribe and nation and people. We pray that the great task of missions would be accomplished in our day. We pray that we would be eager ambassadors for the truth of the coming King. And Lord, we just confess that it's hard when we love our comfort so much and when we try to tell others who are comfortable in this life that they need to escape the coming wrath and find safety in Jesus. This is hard. Would you help us? This is what you have for us. Give us courage and success in it for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.